I was so naughty and I and I thought I was cool, right? And I didn't realize it was because my childhood was so messed up. And so in going back and healing those, it's like I get to have the adulthood that I would have had if I was brought up in a really stable home. Hello, my friend, and welcome to Something for Everybody. My name is Aaron Mashbitz. Melissa, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me on. Absolutely. I'm excited to dive into all of my favorite topics with you today. But before I, before we get into all of that, I have one very important question to ask you. And that is, how are you doing? Like, actually, how are you doing? Um, I'm good. I'm, I've been through a little stressful stage of a lot of organizing. Just had my son's fifth party, fifth birthday party on the weekend. Um, we've got a conference for our company next week, interstate. Um, then we're going away again in, in December. Then I'm going away with the girls in January. So there's been a lot of planning and, you know, getting stuff done. So I think, I feel like I've, I'm mainly on top of that. Um, so coming out the end of that stress is good. And now going into Black Friday sales, now my partner's getting stressed. That's, you know, at least one of us is usually calm <laughs> to balance everything out. <laughs> yeah. It seems like you have a pretty good a uh, mix of uh, work and play there going on. Yeah, definitely. But that was like the whole intention of um, our company moving online uh, beside the fact of co- that COVID happened um, where we had an in-person outpatient addiction clinic. Um, part of moving online was when we had our son and, and we were, I was like, I want to spend more time with him and my partner wanted more freedom as well. So that's been the whole energy behind our business. So yeah, there's a lot of automation and everything so we can have a life as well. (laughs) Yeah. It's super important because you find, I mean, at least I've found in the sort of helping service mental health industry, the person doing the service or doing the helping uh, very rarely has time to take care of themselves and isn't not by their own fault, right? But isn't really doing the things that they're telling other people to do simply because they don't have enough time. Because if you're seeing, you know, 40 patients in a week, which is like an absurd number, uh, yeah. what you want to do when you go home is, is like go to bed and not, you know, potentially choose the right foods or mix in a workout or spend some time with people that you love, you know, all of those things that are really good for your mental health. So yeah, uh, that's interesting. It's um it's really interesting that you bring that up because we're in the alternative space and so we don't we don't run our sessions like normal therapists like even when we had our team um they were working full time but their maximum was four clients a day because sessions would go for longer but we're not just doing talk therapy um and so we could ch- we could charge a lot more because not only obviously I wanted to help people with mental health and addiction because of our own lived experience with that, but also I wanted to help people that were naturally healers, that were naturally really um, could hold safe space for people to open up, to be able to do what they love, um, but part-time, not make it run their whole life. Because like you said, we need to practice what we preach. And so this whole like journey that we've been on to now um, help people set up their own businesses and companies where they're delivering this tra- these transformative therapies, I mean, the the burnout rate is much lower because their clients are getting much better results. They don't have to see 40 clients a week. They can see much less. There's a lot more impact happening. So they don't have to see clients for years and years um, if uh, for clients to get results. And um, so, yeah, I really like, I love that you brought that up. And I just thought that I would touch on that point because, yeah, it is a real problem in the industry where there are very underpaid and working so many hours that they're not in in the best frame of mind to support people long term you know and we need the people that are supporting others to be well to be wealthy in in their health and their time um, so they can be role models for their clients as well yeah 100 percent. people people want to feel like the person that's giving them information is also doing the thing you know, yeah, I learned that. It's like that you go from... to see a personal trainer, but they're like, don't, don't go to the gym or they don't look up, you know, like it's like that. And I think that that needs to shift in the industry for sure. Absolutely. And you can learn that so easily just by being around kids. Like 
when I was coaching 12 and 13 year olds and I wasn't acting the way that I was like in alignment with my words, like there was no way they were going to listen. They saw me doing all this yeah. other horse shit, but I wanted them to do, <laughs> you know, this stuff, you know, I got to be in alignment. I got to be calm, cool, and collected if I want them to be calm, cool, and collected. And uh, that's a valuable lesson to learn. And, and adults are the same way, right? They want to, they want to feel like the person who is, you know, trying to change their life or heal them or transform them is also, you know, transformed and healed. But, you know, we're never at this point where we, we don't have to do any of the work anymore, but we're like a few steps above them. Um, exactly. So something they can that, reach. Yeah, exactly. Because, yeah, that's what some people come in like, oh, I haven't healed all my things. I'm like, you could do healing work until you're 99 and you still wouldn't have got everything. So, yeah, only you only need to be a few steps ahead. But what you were saying about the kids picking up on whether we're in alignment or not, I mean, that's a part of our training is when it comes from polyvagal theory by Dr. Stephen Porges and he talks about co-regulation. So our, our nervous systems are literally scanning constantly for danger or safety, whether we're conscious of it or not, like animals, you know, like how we can feel someone looking at us behind us. It's constantly scanning to see if we're safe. So when it comes to therapy and we're working through the traumas that we've gone to, how we're struggling to relate to our partner because of, you know, the trauma with our mum or wherever the therapy goes, if that person that is holding the space for you, that therapist or that healer, and they're dysregulated, then they're not in a calm state, they're very stressed, our, our bodies can feel that. And especially for guys that go for therapy, like to even open up is a big thing. And so we need to feel that on a deep level. So that's a huge part of what we um, help people with our, our therapists is learning how to regulate their nervous system. So it's not just like, yes, I hold a safe space and I'm a compassionate person, but the person coming in for help can actually feel it. But that's in all areas of our life. It doesn't have to be the therapist-client relationship. It's like with our partner, you know, with our family, everyone can feel when someone's not happy in the room, right? <laughs> So, um, and, and for us to be able to have those skills to, to hold that, to be in alignment, to be calm, right? But it's really interesting, like we're taught, especially guys are taught that you shouldn't show emotion, right? And you shouldn't, you shouldn't cry and things like that. So what happens is that you cut off even feeling how you're feeling, Right. And that's why the suicide rate is so high for males, because it's like all pushed down, all suppressed, all pushed down. And so the flip side of that is like when you're feeling something, letting yourself feel it, you know, to be able to get into a calm state, you know, for let yourself cry if you need to cry, scream if you need to scream. There's starting to like feel our bodies, you know, because even for me, even though I'm a female, I I completely disconnected from my body I had so many addictions I I just like would smoke weed I would drink I, I was taking heroin at one point I was just doing everything I could to try and feel better because society told me like you've got to achieve and be happy all the time and if you know you have a negative emotion if you're sad there's something wrong with you um, and so I just spent my whole time trying to feel good, <laughs> rather, you know, and I just try to ignore all the negative, but it, it, it showed up in my life. All those, all that negativity came through in toxic relationships and addictions and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. You touched on a lot there. Oh, super Sorry. good stuff. <laughs> yeah. No. Awesome. Amazing. Um, but I want to dig deeper into a little bit about, um, about your story. You mentioned, um, some addiction there. You know, as you probably know, people don't usually get into this type of work without a personal connection to it. For me, very personal connection got me into sort of the mental health field and now into sort of personal development to a broader sense. Um, what was it exactly for you and, and how did you get out of it? How did you turn it around? Things like that. Yeah, so I I remember I think I was about 25 or 26 and I had just left my my partner for the second time but we had bought a house together so I'd sold that I was in this like little one bedroom apartment on on the beach but the other guy that I was seeing to leave that guy because I was so insecure like called me and said I can't deal with this so I was basically like just on my own all of a sudden just completely depressed and I just had a moment where I was like 
that meme and it's like maybe I'm the problem maybe I've created all this and I kind of had this realization of like maybe I should get help you know because I grew up just a really hyper independent always bottling everything up there was no one really there for me emotionally so all I knew what to do is to take drugs or hang out with people you know was to try and feel better and so and in that moment that rock bottom for me was like okay I'll I think I need a little I, I need some support so a friend of a friend reached out and I went and had a session and this is coming from a person that I I didn't really believe in therapy I didn't really believe in getting in help um, I was very scientific I was like not into anything like that but I walked out of that session realizing that you know from adulthood you're the cause of most of from your decisions you're the cause of a lot of the issues and I healed some childhood trauma and that awakening that I had when I walked out was incredible where I just it's like a whole new world opened up for me and and um, I continued to get that kind of therapy so it was NLP neuro-linguistic programming for any of you guys that know there was a bit of hypnotherapy and things like that in there and then a few months later um he said, I'm going to do a training. Do you want to come to the training? It will help with your sales job. Because I knew I wanted to start something, but I just didn't know what it was. So I was in a really hard sales job because I'm like, if you have a business, you need to learn sales. Um, I went to that training and halfway through, it hit me like a lightning bolt, like bang. And I realized that I was meant to help people get out of their own way and I was going to do this. And so I had no kids at that time, no pets. You know, I had a little bit of money because I just sold my house and I was like, I'm just going to go for it. Did a few posts on Facebook and kind of just started as a life coach really and uh, started helping entrepreneurs with their limiting beliefs and, and, and really doing their, getting into their startups. And um, I opened a co-working space. So I just went for it straight away. Like I was mm. just like ready. Um, and so that was uh, 2014. And so since then, I've been on a huge journey. I got a, I hired a business coach, learned about like shamanic kind of more inner child healing, uh, lived with a bunch of healers for a year, learned so much more, and then came out with what is now called root cause therapy. Um and yeah, so I'll stop there because I don't know if you have any questions from that bit. Otherwise, I'll keep going on. <laughs> no, yeah, I want to talk about root cause therapy. But before that, it's like yeah. what keeps popping up is like our our sort of society always telling us that the goal is to be happy, right? Yeah. And I, I thought that was like a pretty good goal until I got struck with death in my life. And then – when something like that happens, you want to be able to, one, feel the thing that you're trying to feel. And if your goal is to always be happy all of the time, you're missing out on on a lot of maybe hard emotions, but what makes sort of life worth living, feeling that you lost something, having to grieve over something that you loved, uh, missing something, uh, feeling disappointment. Like those are hard, yes, but they make the other stuff feel so much better. Um and so I think that's, you know, I don't know, that's what I was hearing when you were talking about always wanting to feel good all the time and needing things to make you feel good um, because we're maybe we're afraid. Maybe those emotions were not we weren't allowed to feel those when we were younger. Maybe they were pushed down. Maybe we were told something, maybe something really traumatic happened. So we had to shut everything off to just live and survive. Um, but I think we can frame that better uh, than just be happy. Like, I know purpose yeah. is a big thing now, but maybe we can frame it as fulfillment like more joy like a, a whole experience potentially because then you know you mentioned men too like as men we want to feel emotions but we're we're trying to like cut them down the middle where we only feel certain ones but that if i cut off the sadness and the insecurities and the fear i can't then just like turn on the good ones when they happen i'm also shutting those off too so i become this like robot which is sort of a, a uh, a hurting stereotype for men already, but I want to be able to feel. But the thing with men is that we have to be able to feel in the right moments because there is certain uh, parts of our life where we need to be tough and we need to be stoic for our family or for our kids or whatever. And there are certain parts of our life where, yes, I need to ask for help. I need to cry. I need to express. I need to emote. I need to feel these things. Um, 
But if you cut off one piece, you're, you're cutting off the other side of the emotional spectrum as well. Definitely. And that's really um, what root cause therapy is all about is um, helping people go into those moments where they didn't process, where it wasn't safe to process, where they had shut it off. And so all of these emotions get trapped in our nervous system, in our body, all of these stress hormones get trapped in our body. And that's why sometimes we explode. And that's why, like our body is trying to get it out. That's why we keep recreating negative circumstances over and over again, right? To try and re to try and finish processing what is unprocessed. So it's called trauma reenactment. It's like, you keep having the same issues with your girlfriend. You keep creating the same issues at work. No matter what workplace you go to, it's a, a lot of it is just recreating so your body can finally finish processing. But what we do in root cause therapy is we go back to the root cause, the original event where all the emotions were shut down and we're actually getting someone to process in a really safe space. And sometimes the emotions only take 60 seconds to fully release and we're doing the somatic work, we're doing the breath work, we're getting it to move. And, you know, some people are screaming, some people are crying, some some people are just feeling this intense anxiety, but it's finally getting to release from the body. And when you were saying it's good to feel negative emotions, what we find is when you process the negative emotions, there's so much wisdom under it, there's so much empathy under it, Right. So it's really about like taking the adult self that we have now back to our younger self or whenever the trauma happened, sitting with them and being like, it's you, I'm here for you. You know, it's, it's okay that you're feeling like this. I accept you fully, even though you're expressing this. It's kind of like having the parent we didn't have, getting them to cry or whatever they need to do to, to get it out, getting them to say what they wanted to say, but they didn't feel safe to and to finally process that and bring that wisdom back to now if that makes sense (laughs) yeah absolutely when when you created uh root cause therapy was it just a uh a culmination of all of these practices that you had experienced since you went on your journey and how how did you like distill it into like you know now it's like a course that people can take uh how did you do that yeah so it is a an amalgamation of the best transformative therapies that I could find. And um, so basically I can, I can reel some of those off and I don't know if any, everyone will know what I'm saying, but you may or may not. Um, like I touched on the inner child healing, there's the inner child aspect of it when it's called for. There's the breath work, there's the NLP, neuro linguistic programming. There's a little bit of hypnotherapy, but the therapy itself, people are fully awake. Um, there is timeline therapy, where, um, which is by Tad James. So bless his soul, he's passed away now. Um, there's some gestalt therapy. There's life coaching in there. There's so there's so many other little ones in there, and there's a level two where I've added even more in there. But basically, because of my background of being in corporate, and because of the the space of healing and therapy can be really intangible. And for any of you that have gone to therapy, sometimes it can feel like you're repeating your stories over and over again. And sometimes it can feel like I'm, I'm going back to see my counsel or my therapist and, I, and I'm going around in circles. I'm not quite sure what I'm getting out of it. I created a set way for a therapist to take a client through to go look at someone holistically, like all areas of their life, all of their triggers or their behaviors and thoughts and limiting beliefs that have been created um, in their traumas and to prioritize what to work on on each session and methodically work through those from each session. So from session to session, it's also like, okay, we worked on that, that shifted now, now let's work on this. So it's like a real, like, here's some, for those of you that like data and feedback, this actually has numbers like out of 10. This has like exactly what has shifted in each session. So that's also how I made the training. I'm like, this is what you do next. This is what you do next. So I'm very like a practical person, even though healing and therapy is quite intangible. I try to make it as tangible as I can, as I could, sorry. Um, So that's a huge part of it as well, because I know a lot of therapists and psychologists and things like that, they go through years of training at university they have a lot of theory and a lot of knowledge 
but I see a lot of them posting in the Facebook groups and being like, how do I run a session? <laughs> and that's how I felt when I finished my training. I'm like, great, I've got some great tools. How exactly do I run a session? So that was that's a huge part of root cause therapy as well. It's very important because, you know, the mental mental health or the mental, whatever you want to call it, is the invisible, right? And so yeah. people sometimes feel like they're spinning their wheels. And so like if you relate it to physical health, I can go to the gym for six weeks and my arms will probably be bigger, which is cool. I can see that. I can look in the mirror and be like, oh, shit, that's cool. Nice. But if I go to a therapist for a six weeks, my life may not drastically have changed. But if I'm not actually taking note of like how I feel, like a scale of one to 10, do you feel more joy, less joy, less anxiety, more overwhelmed? What went well? Did you have a good conversation? Did you get angry when someone snapped back at you? Or were you able to calm yourself? Like you have to be able to do those things, but most people don't. They just think like, okay, I'll go to therapy. I'll do the thing. But then how do you know you're actually improving. Like can ha you can have a sense of feeling, but if you're already sort of disconnected from your body to begin with, it's going to be hard to actually feel that you might be getting and feeling better. I said feeling a lot there, but yeah, you get my drift. <laughs> um, exactly. Yeah. At that level ahead. of self-awareness, that level of emotional intelligence improves so much from every session because you're actually learning how to feel your emotions. You're learning that you how you're because what happens is emotions drive behavior. And they also, our thoughts come out of our emotions as well. And so if we're feeling really angry and we don't know what to do with it, often we'll lash out, right? But once you do sessions like this, it's like, oh, emotions are meant to go through my, my body like a wave as, as feedback. And so this is really interesting that I'm feeling this way. Is there anything I need to change in my reality? Am I being triggered by something? All right, cool. I've got that information. Now I'm going to breathe through the emotion. I'm going to sit and feel it. And, and, and you've got those tools to do that now. Then at the end of the emotion, it's like, okay, now I've learned this and I've, and I've got that wisdom. So it's not just in the session that they get the benefit. It's like actually feeling safe to feel what they're feeling and not trying to change the outside world to make themselves feel better, if that makes sense. Yeah, you're essentially trying to take complete responsibility and ownership over your life. I mean, yeah. <laughs> that's like, you know, the number one thing you can do if you want to feel better. Because uh, if, you know, like you said, when you're in those relationships, right, if everything is always outside of me, it's everyone else's fault, but then I am left alone, well, maybe I need to take a deeper look. And it doesn't make you a, a bad or a horrible person, not one bit. Everyone has those struggles. It just makes you someone who now needs to take control of the things they can take control of, like their daily actions, their habits how they feel about themselves, like how they move, how they eat, how they think, how they sleep, all of that plays a part in totally. you feeling your best. Yeah. And so my, my partner and co-founder of the Center for Healing, so he came, like I met him when I started my business and we met, we were both doing a talk at a doctor's. I was talking about mental health. He was talking about health. He was selling um, some network marketing kind of nutrition um supplement at the time and then yeah like um we caught up a couple of times and then a year later like I didn't hear from him for a year like he went MIA and I was like I saw him online I'm like hey what's going on and I just felt him like I just felt like my heart was like in so much pain I'm like I feel like you're not okay like you've got a lot of hurt in your heart he's like funny you say that I I need to come see you he goes I can't remember exactly what you do but I need to come see you and he came in and this is a guy that goes to the gym, like he was very buff and like really healthy and everything. He walked in to my office and I had to like not share how I felt inside, but he'd lost about 15 kilos, his clothes were all ripped and he proceeded to tell me that he'd kind of gone down this road of methamphetamines and GHB and um was live like was dating a dealer and just living in a drug den and I was like, okay, wow. But um, the cool thing is like a few days before I had a huge discovery of how to help people with their addictions because I was still smoking and I was trying to overcome um, my addictions as well. And I, in that session, it was a three-hour session. From that session, he never used again. He didn't even feel like it. Straight away he was like jumped into the personal development world, the healing world. He was like, this is amazing. He signed up for a, a course, um, a mental health course, but 
he was like messaging me. He's like, they're not talking about trauma. They're not talking about like emotions <laughs> in these kind of mainstream government, you know, courses. So he ended up leaving. And I remember he sent me a message. He's like, I don't, I don't know like how you're going to do this, but can you teach me everything you know? Like I want to help people with addictions. I, I want to open up a center. And I said, yeah, I'll teach you. So I'm like, here's like 50 books and all the training manuals and everything, all the amalgamations of like what I had learned. And it was funny because with his housemate at the time, he said his housemate thought he was like lost his mind because he just had like <laughs> headphones on. He had binaural beats playing and he was just studying flat out day and night because um, he didn't have a job and stuff. And, you know, he he had gone to have therapy and his, and his friends were trying to find him because he was in this drug den and his family was trying to help him. But, you know, working with me was the only thing that helped him or like doing, you know, this work that we were doing, the deep healing work. Um, so, yeah, and then we decided, okay, let's open up a center together. He, we, we had no money. He just finished being a drug addict. Um, I just finished, you know, a year of just mucking around trying to make this method. And um, we got a crappy little office with like uh, secondhand furniture. And we were really lucky. We just like, we would just start, see how we go. We borrowed uh, the money from his parents to pay the first month of rent. And he was lucky enough that he got a um, a interview in the main newspaper in here in Melbourne, Australia. He got a feature article on his journey. And so I'm like, I'm, we didn't even have our phones connected yet. We hadn't even written the programs properly. And I'm just like picking up the phone, like taking bookings, taking bookings. And so it shut off straight away. And he's a really empathetic guy, but like he had so much anxiety. He felt so alone. He didn't know how to process his emotions. Again, he was just using drugs as a coping mechanism. So once he awakened to this, being like aware of like how to feel your emotions and that you can process it and um, you don't, you know, you don't have to just um, numb it all the time. That was huge for him. And so that was like the start of, that was 2016. Um, and um, now he's also got a colleague that works under the umbrella and he was a heroin addict and he, and I don't know if you want to interview them because their story is amazing, but he went to rehab 16 times and he wow. didn't, and it didn't work. <laughs> yeah. And um, after doing this kind of work that we're doing, um, it wasn't with us, but it was, um, he had his own path, but it was very similar um, in terms of the methods he stopped using as well. And now he's a trainer and a teacher. So we lived experience um, in terms of where we come from with the work that we're doing. Um so this is like our, this is our absolutely like life's work and, and our passion. And we're obsessed with teaching people about trauma and emotions just because it's so important. It does run our lives every day and um, it does affect us and our relationships every day. So, yeah. <laughs> what do you think about the, the current addiction practices? Because I've only heard one other addiction specialist say that you can become fully recovered from being an addict. Other people say I'm an addict in recovery. Uh, and so I find those things very interesting because I know both uh, thoughts have worked for people, you know, um, but what, what, what is your take on all that? Yeah, I think most people's go to is abstinence. So just stopping and the way that we approach it is quite different. Um, and so when people used to come into our our clinic, our um, outpatient addiction clinic, we would say to them, look, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do the really deep he healing work. It's really intense. They're like, that's great. I need intense. Um, and we'd say, when we don't want you just to stop because people are like, oh, do I have to detox first? We're like, no. Because what we found was that as people do this work, they naturally are able to feel better in themselves without needing the whatever they were taking to get to a certain level of peace, right? So it's like literally you, imagine you've suppressed all your emotions since you were a baby, right? And then so the only way, because we're just always trying to feel good, right? Just let's be honest. Everyone's just trying to feel okay. <laughs> and so if we take have a, a drug and the reason why some people get addicted, some people don't, we have a drug and it makes us feel okay, and then, but because it wears off, we go back to it again. And that's all we're trying to do. 
But if we go back and release all the stuff that's causing us not to feel okay that we've suppressed, that's made it overwhelmingly not okay to feel safe in the present moment, then people naturally stopped using. Like we would see people for eight or 12 weeks and we would never tell them to stop and they they would naturally be like, I don't need it anymore. Or when I take it, it actually makes me feel crap because now it's pulling them back down. It's not lifting them up because they're naturally their baseline is better. And so that's the way that we approach it. So our perspective of like 12 step programs is it's great that their um, certain steps are great, but guilting people and shaming people if they relapse because for us when someone relapsed we're like awesome you've relapsed what came up why did you relapse what were the thoughts that you're having that day all right let's deal with it like we celebrated the relapses because we found something else that we can work on to make it more long-term and effective and just another little analogy to kind of bring it together for all the listeners is imagine someone's broken their hip and they're in pain right and they're in, in, the, in the hospital Imagine if you would say, I'm going to take away your painkillers because it's bad for you. We're going to stop that. And that person is in pain, right? Is my, um, that, that person's in pain and you take away the painkillers and then you're like, okay, you just need to suffer now for the rest of your life. You just need to be in that pain. Emotional and physical pain is quite a, like a similar place in the brain and so when you're telling someone to stop without healing why they started using in the first place then that's not fair like that's not someone living do you know what I mean yeah I do I do know what you mean and it's it makes me think about um addiction you know some people say that that's a choice you chose to be an addict um, and what really I think is that, uh, and people who are, are knowledgeable in this subject like yourself, it's more of a response to something, right? And so what you're saying is if we go back and we find what that response might be, then the choice would be not to partake in that activity to maybe do something better, but ultimately it's a response for something. But, you know, if I'm a, like a six year old girl and I see my dad is addicted to, drinking alcohol, I'm that little girl. I see that as a choice because I'm little and I don't know what he's responding to. So that's where that thing can come from. And I, that makes total sense to me to be a little person and be like, my dad is choosing alcohol over me, but he's really trying to just survive. And his response to that survival is the addiction. And so ultimately you can definitely recover from that because you, you can heal sort of what's underneath it all. That's right. But yeah, we a lot of people just don't know that you can do that and that the tools are available. So um, we, because we're an alternative clinic, we um, attracted a lot of people that have gone through mainstream that were just put in hospital or just told just to stop or you're just seeing a counsellor or a psychologist, which are great in themselves, but they just wanted something more deeper, more intense, something that could actually shift how they're feeling. So we just say like addiction is a coping mechanism. It's just mm. self-medicating, right? Um, so yeah, healing those wounds allows us to naturally stop self-medicating. Yeah. What is, uh, to sort of <laughs> jump to a different subject here, uh, but something else yeah. that you're very, very interested in would be, um, would be manifesting. Um, how does that play a part in trauma, in healing, in the work that you do? Yeah, I think um, manifesting has a bad, like not a bad name, but some people are like, oh, manifesting. Like, <laughs> Well, yeah, um, because all they did was read The Secret and they're like, that shit's yeah. fucking whack. <laughs> oh, I know. And like I was, I think I was 21 when I read or watched The Secret and I did. I manifested a three-bedroom house, a sports car um, and all of this stuff. And But what it teaches you is like toxic positivity. It's like think positive you've got to be in a good vibration and then good things come in and just think about what you want and it will appear so I spent all my time trying to be positive completely disconnected from my negative emotions so yeah we've circled back um and I ruined my relationship I lost that house I had a car accident I lost my like I sabotaged all of it because I'm like everything's great everything's positive I was not willing to feel anything 
Um, and so I completely chucked manifesting out the window. And so when I got into healing work, I was like still not into manifesting, but it just happened that working with one of my coaches, um, she taught me how to shift some energy, some of my trauma to then manifest, like just for our business specifically to like expand our business. And I was like, hang on a second, these worlds need to come together. And that's why I created trauma for manifesting. So it's like, just say you want to manifest something, right? Just say you want to manifest a car that you really want, but maybe part of you doesn't feel worthy. Maybe you've got beliefs like your parents said you should never buy a sports car and like all this stuff comes up in the way and we have all these excuses. That's just the body trying to keep you safe, safe in your relationships, trying to keep you safe from not being stressed. Like you might think, oh, if I get a new car, I have to work double as hard and I don't want to do that and we sabotage. So it's looking at manifesting through like, number one, do you feel okay to want what you want? Which I think guys are more likely to, society has made them it's okay to want what they want, but for us women, we're not allowed to like want big things. Um, but then it's like, okay, I can want that. Okay, now my body is freaking out. My nervous system is freaking out maybe because of past traumas. Like for me right now, I'm trying to buy a house, but my body, because I've lost two houses, the trauma of that, my body's not letting me, it's sabotaging me. So I'm working through that right now. So it's like, okay, I've got blocks to this. So how can we somatically heal what is in the way of what I want to manifest? So for example, we were like making 30K months, 30K months, just covering the bills, just covering the staff wages for the therapists, right, at the healing centre. Then when we moved online, somehow without the overheads, without the office, without the staff, we were still making the same amount of money but still sending the same amount of money. We even moved to a tropical island, you know, in, in Asia where it was cheaper. I'm like, how is this happening? Like, what? what is going on? Like, we still have this glass ceiling. And so when I did the healing work, I, I discovered that unconsciously I was did not want to make profit because a part of me was scared that my partner would become a drug addict again. Mm. And this wasn't even conscious. This is my body like, if we make any profit, we have any extra money, he's going to go become a meth addict again, even though he hadn't used for like years and years and years, right? right? And so I was like, oh my gosh. So once I shifted that and allowed my body to feel safe to let my money in, Within two weeks, we got to 50 grand. And then, like, the rest is history. Now we're like 100 grand, 200 grand a month. Um, and it, so it was like my body just did not feel safe. So, do you feel safe? Enough? Like, you might have like a vision board, but you do actually feel safe to call those things in. Like, you're trying to call in your ideal relationship. Have you worked through the traumas of what you went through in your past relationships? Like, so that's why I look at manifesting really differently. And that's what I teach our coaches to help their clients with achieving goals, whatever the goal may be, it might be a sports goal, it might be a, a financial goal, but through the trauma-informed lens. Yeah. I think man, like that idea of manifesting also is, are you like capable of receiving the thing that you want? Like, are you ready for that? Are you ready for the relationship that could be the last one and the best one that you've ever had and could be the lifelong partnership. Are you ready? Is that like you say you want it and you could manifest it, but are you really are you really capable for it? And if you're not, you're probably not doing those little things that will bring that to you. Um, yeah. yeah. So I think that's important too. Yeah. Some things that we look at is like, do we feel worthy? Do you think it's possible? Does it feel safe? Um, are you Are you allowing it to come in? And so it's not only bringing it in, like I was really good at manifesting, but not keeping it. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people will manifest like their biggest month or they'll manifest like a pay rise or they'll manifest yet yeah, a really amazing partner. But once they're in there, because they haven't dealt with, dealt with their traumas and because they, their relationship with their self is not very good or they still have insecurities and maybe they don't feel safe to actually communicate that with their new partner, then they sabotage a relationship, they sabotage a new job. Like, so the course is really also about like not only manifesting, but being able to hold on to it as well, which is like an important part of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Keeping, keeping the thing that you wanted so badly and not sabotaging once you get the thing, because you know, other things maybe, yeah, you don't feel worthy now that you have it and all those things that you mentioned. So that's, um, that's really important. I wanted to ask you one more thing. 
Uh, well, yeah. maybe not one more thing, but another thing just came to yeah. my mind. And um, you've said uh, it's it's never too late to have a good childhood. What's that mean? I feel like, and depending where someone is on their journey, whether they're not into this work or whether they're starting to get into this healing work or just, you know, seeing a post on Instagram and going, oh, that did happen in my childhood. And I, and I do feel like that these days, or you've been do, doing healing work for a while, it can be really easy to go into, well, I was a victim growing up, whether it be sexual trauma, whether our parents are physically, emotionally abusive or just not there, not attentive to us. Um, and so we can often just blame our parents and be in a state of continual victimhood and not um, really grabbing that and going, I'm going to have post-traumatic growth and I'm going to grow from this. We can often be like, well, I'm like this and I do this because my childhood was like that. You know, I have these mental health issues because my childhood was like this or I have the addictions because my childhood is like that. And that is totally valid. But at the same time, it's like, but I'm, I'm working on it. And so then you can go, okay, now it's time for me to reparent myself. You know, if my parents weren't there for me, it's time for me to be there for my inner children. If I went through trauma, it's time for me to go back and, and heal those. And that's why if we can have, it's like I grew up around people, especially I went to a private school and like all these girls are so level headed and had their stuff together. And I was just wild. I was like getting like suspended all the time. And I was like this. I was so naughty and I and I thought I was cool, right? And I didn't realize it was because my childhood was so messed up. And so in going back and healing those, it's like I get to have the adulthood that I would have had if I was brought up in a really stable home. Mm. I've I thought I was done, like I failed at everything. And now obviously I've made a course, I've written a book, I've done so many things. I don't have my addictions anymore because I was able to go back and give myself the childhood that I didn't get and the support and love that I didn't get through the healing work. Wow. That's very profound. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's super cool. Like that last thing you just said about having the adult life that you would have had if you had a safe and supportive childhood and you can create that. That's very cool and very empowering and gives people a lot of ownership and responsibility to take into their own hands. Because when you're a child, you don't. You don't. It's not any of it. It's none of your fault. Like you didn't yep. choose this. Like you're just trying to do the best you can. And the people around you are also trying to do the best they can. I think that's an important note. But you have no control over it. Like you're just, you're sort of the there. And these are your caregivers and this is what you got. But now you have some, you know, some sovereignty over your life and can make some different choices and give yourself the adult life that you would have had, which is really cool. So. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's incredible. It's incredible where it's an honor to hold space for people to go through that journey and also, yeah, to receive that and to be on the healing side of that as well. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, everything that we've been talking about um, is part of your, your center of healing that you are the co-founder of. Um, and you guys have some new courses, new online courses coming up. Could you tell us more about that? Yeah, sure. So um, I just uh, finished recording and it's been released. It's called the Self-Healing Protocols. So it is for people that want to have some tools outside of getting therapy or maybe you're not ready to go to therapy and you want to just have some tools to start healing yourself. And it's an eight-week journey, kind of self-paced with rituals in between. Um, we have male and females in there, so you're welcome to jump in. We've got a really good community, and you can also share and ask questions, and I'm and I'm there. Um, and you can take it from anywhere in the world. All of our courses are all um, online. And um, the, the other thing is, too, if you're wanting to be a coach or practitioner, maybe you already are, or you're like, I really want to get into the space of helping people, we do have a free certification that we're offering for it to become a trauma-informed coach. Um, so that's that's something that we, it, it was a paid one, <laughs> and it's by Matt and Ryan, and it was a paid one, and I yeah, I just had like this intuition, this download one day of like, we need to make a really big impact. And to do that, we need to make this one for free. And I had to kind of approach them really gently and be like, I know you worked really hard on this course. <laughs> um, 
the really beautiful thing is that people are taking it, the teachers are taking it, managers are taking it, CEOs are taking it, um, not just coaches, everyone's taking it to start to become aware of, you, you can tell when someone is having PTSD or a trauma response, you can tell that, like you said earlier, that energy, when you come into the room, do people feel safe in your energy? Are you aware? So it's really learning about the, your biology of your nervous system. And it's really learning about how to hold safe space for people and recognize when someone's, you know, being triggered. Um, and so that's usually the entry level for a lot of people um, just to get a taste of our courses. We have a lot of free courses, you know, pre-training. So all of our trainings just to experience what we're like. Some people might resonate with Ryan and Matt's more, especially guys. Some people might resonate with um, the way that I train. And so Ryan and Matt have a course as well. But um, yeah, we go to the centerforhealing.com forward slash free dash courses. You can just have a little look there. There's even... um little short courses on addictions as well and also for families with loved ones that are experiencing addictions we have a family families of addictions course as well i think that's the 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 secret sauce to um sort of ending this quote unquote mental health crisis is getting a, like real impactful, important information in the hands of non-degreed people who see a lot of people all the time. Because there's only so many licensed mental health therapists and it's very hard to get your license. You can't do it in America. You can only practice in one state if you're licensed in that state, which is absurd. Um, you know, So there's just not enough people to help all the people that might need help. And so if we can get this information into coaches, like I'm in the sports world, right? If all coaches had the sort of information, they'd be able to just pass on these little nuggets of information. Boom, teachers and counselors and principals and whatever, right? Non-degreed people are seeing a lot of people and then at least someone's informed in a lot of these things and they can sort of begin to go on the healing journey. Now, if they need a little bit more in-depth treatment, there's some places to go, obviously, but that's sort of the, at least what I think is a, is a pathway forward to ending this quote-unquote mental health crisis and getting more people who are fulfilled and happy and joyous and can deal with their emotions and understand themselves a little bit better and all that stuff. Definitely. And I just want to touch on one thing, like, especially for coaches, doesn't matter what kind of coach you are. Um, this is kind of like this, this fear-based fear bro coaching that, you know, is quite normal. What you need to understand is, and, and some things that we teach in the course is like, um, when your nervous system is activated, when you're scared, you're in survival, your prefrontal cortex shuts down. So this is the main part of your brain that has a critical thinking. And that's why when you go to do something, like say you go to do a speaking gig, right, and, and you just all of a sudden go blank and you like feel very anxious, that's because the nervous system has gone into fight and flight. So imagine when you're training someone and you're coaching someone and you don't know how to help them to feel safe to work with you and the way that you're speaking to them and holding space to get them the optimal performance and results. If you don't know things like this, they're not going to learn as well as you want them to learn and you'll end up shouting at them and, and, and whatever. So like you said, getting it getting this information in, into schools, like of how to recognize that in kids. For me, I couldn't learn. I was so disassociated from what was happening at home. It was not safe to be in the present moment. I couldn't take any information in. And mm. I thought I was dumb, but I was actually having a trauma response, a stress response. Um, so, yeah, I wish my school had this because I fell through the cracks. And so, yeah, this is the impact that needs to be made in so many areas is recognizing this, recognizing our humanness and, and, and that nature and how we best learn, if that makes sense. Absolutely. That's it. That's beautiful. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you, Melissa, for your insight, your time, your attention. Uh, if people want to know more about you, I know that you said the Center for Healing website, but is there anywhere else for them to go? Um, yeah, just... Um, come over to Instagram, so at the Centre for Healing. Um, that's where we put a lot of the clips from our courses and you can find all of our links as well. Fantastic. Well, thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you. What's up, everybody? Thank you for tuning into that episode. And if you enjoyed it, click here for another full-length episode of the podcast. And please don't forget to subscribe. But above all else, most importantly, Please take good care of yourselves 
and others. And I'll see you next time. Lots of love. Cheers.